You're invited to a women's retreat at Camp Wanaki on March 7th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. The speaker will be Pat Fellman. She is a highly sought after motivational speaker. Her topic will be celebrating the joy of Jesus in our lives. Crystal Shaheen will be providing the music. Good morning. I'd like to invite you to the women's retreat down at Camp Wanaki on March 7th. If you've never been on a retreat before, now is the time to come. You know, Pastor Brian in our current sermon series talks about that it's really important to take care of our soul because it's the most important part of us. And I think the women's retreat is going to be a great opportunity to do just that. I mean, it, it will be like a spa day for the soul. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> the camp is beautiful. Yeah. The speaker is motivational and very inspirational. And it's just a good time to get away. One of the things that I really enjoyed about last year's retreat was getting to know people that, you know, I maybe saw in church on Sunday, um, but didn't really know. And it really gave me an opportunity to get to know them better. And then I also met some people that I hadn't ever seen before in church. And uh, the table, the group of ladies that all sat together, we just really hit it off. In fact, even well after the retreat, we would continue to meet like maybe on a monthly basis for breakfast or something. But it was just a great opportunity to really connect um, and talk with other ladies. You will go home filled to the brim and your soul will be fed. Please join us at Camp Wanaki on March 7th from 9 to 4. The cost is $35, which includes lunch. Registration forms are available at the office, on the website, and after all services today at the table in the narthex. Gift certificates are available. Good morning, I'm Dawn Smith, and I just want to encourage you to come to the women's retreat and bring a friend. It is at Camp Monarchy, but it's going to be in the retreat center. So it's going to be cozy and warm with the fireplace. No mud, no snow, no uh, bonfires or <laughs>
Um, want to start the morning off with just kind of a little bit of family business, so to speak. Um, I wanted to announce to all of you that uh, Bishop John Hopkins has uh, decided to appoint Pastor Michael Holland uh, to the Avon United Methodist Church beginning July 1. Uh, Micah will be resuming uh, that duty as uh, their pastor at that time. Uh, you know, uh, four years ago when Micah joined us in our congregation, I quickly came to the understanding that uh, we are deeply blessed to have this gifted and talented uh, yeah, uh, man of the Lord. And that, uh, you know, I knew we wouldn't be able to keep him forever here. Uh, as our associate uh, in charge of our young adult ministry. Uh, I was hoping maybe to get five years out and we got four, that's pretty good. Uh, and so Micah will be uh, starting that. It's really a great opportunity. It's a congregation that uh, really has a great deal of potential. And I know with Micah's leadership, uh, I think the bishop has already seen that and that uh, has decided to make that particular appointment. You know, as Methodists, I, you, we, uh, it's one of those in our system, you kind of go as the bishop sends you, and so that's kind of what happens. And so uh, the bishops made that call, and we are thrilled. It, it, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna bless Micah and have some kind of, kind of uh, sending off opportunity in June. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're gonna be working with our staff parish relations committee along with our bishop uh, to try to find uh, somebody to kind of come and fill the role uh, that Micah had uh, performed here at Church Lake. So I just wanted to make that announcement. That's why you probably saw me like, where's Pastor Brian? Kind of where's Waldo? Uh, I was over there announcing it there and snuck in here uh, after the ma making that announcement. Um, we are concluding a six-week series on uh, soul keeping, caring for the most important part of you. We really kind of focused on this idea that all of us have been given a gift by our creator, this thing that we call our soul. It is that part of us that lasts for eternity with our creator. It really integrates our wills, our minds, and our bodies. And then we are made by God, our souls are made by God, that our souls are made for God and that our souls have opportunities to be nourished and fed in this journey and that we are all responsible for the care of each of our own souls. We can pollute our soul with junk or we can feed our souls with life-giving strength. And that's what this series has been about trying to find ways by which we can feed our, our souls with strong nutrition. Uh, but uh, today, I, I also want to talk about how all of us in our journey with God may encounter moments when we don't feel that God is very present, that our prayers may go pretty dry, and that we kind of enter into kind of a dark season uh, and these are places we don't necessarily want to go. In fact, we would prefer not to go there, frankly. And yet, even in the midst of these challenging seasons, that they can be used by God to help us grow, mature in our faith, and find a strength uh, that comes realizing our dependence on our Creator. And so today's message is going to be about, really, how you care for your soul when you go through that dark night. And for that, I'd just like to pause and have a time of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious and Heavenly Father, we turn to you for strength. We turn to you for solace. We turn to you for comfort. And Lord, we know how easily we can get distracted how many forces are trying to pull us apart. And sometimes how we call out to you and we don't seem to get much of an answer. But Lord, we know that in your time that we will find a grace and a strength 
that surpasses our wildest understanding. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be found loving and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Three weeks ago, while we, uh, we were in Israel, in the Holy Land, our tour bus uh, went to uh, the north side of the Sea of Galilee and made a stop at a little church uh, called the Primacy of Peter. It's a, Frances- a Franciscan uh, uh, sanctuary which uh, marks the location where tradition says that Jesus appeared to Peter and six other disciples uh, uh, after he was resurrected. Maybe you will recall in your Bible that in the Gospel of John, there is that account that Peter and these disciples, after uh, Jesus had been crucified, that Jesus had appeared to them in Jerusalem, but then it kind of went away, and they didn't know what to do, and so they kind of returned to that which was familiar to them. They went back to their region around Capernaum and on the Sea of Galilee and began their livelihood of fishing one more time. But as John recalls the story, that uh, as it was early in the morning, uh, Peter and his friends were out fishing. It was even before the dawn had broke, and there was a figure along the seashore who called out to them to cast their net on the other side. And so, since they didn't have much luck earlier, they decided to kind of follow that. They cast it on the other side, and they brought in a huge haul of fish. It was at that moment uh, that the light began to shine, morning began to break, and they realized that that figure on the shore was the Lord Jesus himself. So Peter jumps out of the boat, he swims to the shore, and there uh, Jesus has prepared for them a charcoal fire, and uh, they have some bread, and they have breakfast together. This little church that we stopped at kind of marks that kind of where tradition locates that particular uh, story in John's gospel. And uh, so we uh, are there, and uh, at that time, the tour guide, uh, he, uh, FJ, he asked to read that passage in John's gospel. And so Amy, my wife, volunteered. And this is what she read uh, on that particular seashore. I mean, like, let's say the church is here. Uh, the sea shore is about where the doors of the back of the sanctuary are located. And we were kind of right on the little beach going down right by the water side uh, when Amy read this particular passage uh, found in John's gospel. It said this. When they had finished breakfast, remember Jesus and the seven disciples, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Jesus said to him, or Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And so he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so Jesus said to him, tend to my sheep. He said to him yet a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And so he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you that when you were younger, you, you, you used to fasten your belt and go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which would glorify God. And after this, Jesus said to him, Follow me. This is God's word for God's people. 
As Amy was reading that particular passage, I, you know, I'd like to say I was completely fixated on my wife at that time, but I was looking out onto this kind of picturesque scene, and there was a fisherman about 100 yards uh, to the west of us, and he had a pole that he was casting out from the shore. And uh, he cast out about 50 yards or so out into the sea. And I was watching him, and all of a sudden, I could see that his pole was beginning to bend. And then he began to kind of reel in. And at this time, you know, as Amy is reading this passage, I'm like, how cool is this? You know, I'm here in this perfect location. My wife's talking about the bringing in of all these fish. And here I am watching a real fisherman bring in a fish on the Sea of Galilee. And I'm waiting, you know, I'm looking for the water to part and, you know, one to fly through the air like a good bass, you know, and that's what I'm kind of envisioning. And, and he's pulling in and after a while, I kind of note that it seems strange that he had this little dinghy next to him. And so he puts the pole into the dinghy and he starts rowing out into the water. I'm like, wow, this guy's got a big fish that he's got to get closer to bring this thing in. And um, as Amy's finishing up this passage of scripture and I'm watching this guy and then it begins to dawn on me what was happening. The reason he had gotten into the boat was that he wasn't pulling in any fish that he had hit a tangle, a snag, and he was navigating the boat to try to get into a position so that he could kind of release his line and save his hook. And you know, I kind of thought about that, you know, just in those times when you really kind of think of this cool thing happening, we hit the snags and the tangles of life. Isn't that the way it goes, huh? The snags and tangles. Well, certainly, um, Peter uh, could resonate with those times of, uh, of facing snags and tangles on the, the Sea of Galilee. Because, you know, I think in this whole series on caring for this most important part of us, that we also have to acknowledge that there are times that we really, we find nurture and strength in God's presence in our lives. But we also have to confess there are times when we will feel absence, that we will feel a sense of being spiritually dry. And that even in the, those particular moments, those dark nights of our souls where we go in places, frankly, we would rather not go. But these are also opportunities how God is shaping us, God is strengthening us, God is forming us in God's image. For we know, for instance, in the story of Peter, that you know here was a man who had gone through the greatest kind of moments of the journey of Jesus. You know, Peter was with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration when the glory of the Lord appeared. Peter was there when he, Jesus fed the 5,000. Peter was there when he saw miracles of healing. Peter was there when Lazarus was raised. And yet, Peter was also there when Jesus was betrayed on that night. Jesus, or Peter was also there to see uh, how he'd gone to trial before Caiaphas. Remember, it was Peter who denied Jesus three times in that courtyard of Caiaphas. And it was Peter who obviously felt the sting of the crucifixion of Jesus. He had been with the Lord for three years. And now it all seemed like the floor had opened up and his life was beginning to dissolve. And yet, even in the midst of those dark nights, Peter also got glimpses of grace. For we read about how shortly after that crucifixion, that on that third day, Jesus had appeared and through the wonder and the amazement and the power of God, the resurrected Jesus had made an appearance. 
But just as soon as that appearance was made, Jesus left them. And Peter is wondering what to do. And so they go back to their own kind of thing that was most familiar, going back fishing. Until we come to this story that I shared with you today, then once again, Jesus appears. And they have a feast, don't they? I mean, this is something I, I could just see kind of a, a true highlight of Peter's life, to have breakfast with the resurrected Jesus. And as soon as that breakfast was over, Jesus begins to ask a question. And honestly, it's a question that all of us will need to grapple with in our spiritual journey with the Lord. And that's when Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Not once, not twice. That's all like, well, maybe he didn't hear me. Uh, three times, Jesus repeats that question. Peter, do you love me? Now, why did he have to ask three times? Now, some scholars say, well, you know, because Peter denied three times that the statement of Peter required three times to affirm that, you know, Peter loved him. But I, I think perhaps there's something more going on here. I think the reason that Jesus asked this question over and over and over again is that, you know, this core issue of love is absolutely central to our lives. That at the end of the day, nothing else is more important and to how you respond to that question, do you love the Lord Jesus? And, and I'm not talking about love as an emotional, you know, a feeling that kind of comes over your soul. No, you see, in the Bible, love is always perceived as an act of the will where you extend yourself for the benefit of another. That's what love is about. It's not a feeling. It's really a sense of caring for those and sacrificing, uh, of giving of yourself to another. That's what this is all about. Peter, do you love me? Are you willing to extend yourself for really what is most important, a relationship with me? And that's the question that Jesus asked. But not only is a question asked, then a task is given. You notice what that task is? He starts off and says, you know, you gotta feed uh, my lambs. You gotta tend to my sheep. You gotta feed my sheep. Three times, same response. And what I think all of us have to realize is that if we want to grow in our relationship to our creator, it's not just about asking about our, our connection to our creator. It is also all about caring for those who Christ has called us to care for. Those who are weak those who are in need. That's our task. And friends, I hope if you hear anything, you begin to realize that, you know, if we want to find significance in this journey, we're not going to be sitting there finding that significance by staring into a mirror, by looking at our belly button and gazing at it. You know, it's always going to be about how are we going to bless and care for others. And that's why Jesus constantly is referring that question. You've got to feed sheep. You've got to tend to the flock. You've got to care for the lambs that God has put into your life. So not as a question asked, not only is a task given, but then a prediction is offered to Peter. And what is that prediction? Uh, it's found right here um, when uh, it says this. You know, Peter, very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone will fasten around a belt around you and he's gonna take you in where you do not wish to go. Wow, that's a pretty sobering prediction, 
isn't it? And it really goes against most of what our culture says. You know, our culture says that once you get to a, a certain point in life, then you get to do whatever you want to do. I mean, when you're a kid, you know, they say, well, when you hit 18, then you get to do whatever you want to do. And then after you hit 18, they say, well, after you go to college, then you can go out and kind of live out the world. You can do whatever you want to do. And then when you get to my station in life, you're like, man, when you get rid of the last kid out of the household and, and, you know, you can kind of go and travel and you can go and do whatever you want to do. (laughs) And that's the image. And here, my friends, is the reality that as you mature, As you grow up, you can begin to find it's not about doing your agenda. It's not about doing what you want to do. It is always going to be about how you're willing to be led. And sometimes in places you do not wish to go. And those places that we do not wish to go are often what is called those dark night the dark night of our soul. And and that is a term that was coined by a man that lived 450 years ago in Spain. He's known as St. John of the Cross. St. John of the Cross lived uh, in a time where there was a lot of corruption within his church. And he was a reformer. He wanted to make things better. And yet, instead of kind of being celebrated for these reforms, that the authorities within the church imprisoned him. They stuck him in a cell that was seven feet by 10 foot. They fed him bread and water for over three years. It was during this time when he was in the dark cell in the middle of Spain that St. John wrote his classic, The Dark Night of the Soul. And and, and friends, the essence of this dark night is that so many times we think that, that God's will and God's way is only revealed to us in joy, revealed to us in light, revealed to us in presence. And what John relates is that many times God's power can be felt in darkness God's power can be felt in the midst uh, of uh, suffering and pain. And, And really, that's what John the Cross is helping all of us realize, that in this journey to grow more and more like Jesus, we may very well encounter seasons where it seems like we're really suffering. And I'm not talking about, we all suffer. Everybody in this room suffers in one way, shape, form, or another. I'm not talking about just physical suffering or emotional suffering. I am talking about a suffering that occurs in the midst of silence. Do you understand that? It's like where previously, maybe your prayer life was rich and fulfilling, and now it just seems dry. Maybe at times when you open up the Bible and, wow, the pages just leapt up at you. Maybe there are times when worship was so meaningful and significant, and now it seems like you're just going through the motions. That is really what is describing this dark night of the soul. And and what you have to realize is that this is not necessarily punishment from God, uh, and it's not necessarily, you know, getting your just desserts. Instead, this silence of God, this dark night of the soul, can very well be an opportunity for you to grow deeper and stronger in the faith, that even sometimes by testing is where we begin to discover a resolve and a strength that honestly we can take for granted. Let me give you an example. I think any of you who is a teacher, you're gonna realize quickly that uh, it's sometimes good for your students to struggle a little bit when you give them problems. I mean, for instance, uh, as a teacher, you could easily go and you could give all of the answers to all of the different problems to your students. And certainly, they could get a good grade. Perhaps you would look good on some standardized testing in the state of Ohio offers to you. I mean, you can do that. But friends, I think we all begin to realize that 
that's not what we're really to be about. That sometimes there is benefit in really wrestling, sometimes struggling, in order to try to get to that point where insight and maturity begins to set in. And, and I think in a similar fashion, that you know, God's not always going to give us the clear-cut answers to our challenges in life. I mean, we want everything right now, right here. We live in a quick fix society. We want to take a pill and make our issues go away. We don't need to. I mean, why lose weight the hard way by exercise when we can sit there and take a pill and just have it vanish away instantly before our eyes? That's our society. We want quick fixes. We want instant results. But I think all of us that have maturity begin to realize that sometimes we find really what we most need through struggle, through really kind of discernment and patience. Patience even as we go through this particular challenge of life. St. John on the Cross uh, he put it uh, in this way. He goes, you know, God's love is not content to leave us in our weakness. And for this reason, he will take us into that dark night. Of course, this begs the question, doesn't it? You're in the dark night. What do you do? <laughs> well, here's the challenge, friends. You do nothing. <laughs> and we hate that answer. We want to read a book. We want to do some kind of practice. We want to sing kumbaya. And instantly, the dark night of the soul will kind of leave us. But you know, friends, what we have to sense is that when you're in that dark night, that really, it's an opportunity to kind of patiently wait for God to be revealed to you. Uh, Francis Faber, he put it this way. You know, in our spiritual life, God chooses to try our patience, first of all, by his slowness. Please remember, God is slow. We are swift. It's because we are but for a time. He has been for all eternity. And, and I think what we in this life of maturity begin to see is that God can work passively through his absence rather than just actively through his presence. And I, and I know in my own life, you know, there was a season of my ministry which was pretty challenging and, and my solution to that was just work longer, go faster, go harder, try to accomplish more and more, and that that would solve the challenge that was before me. And what I began to discover that instead of that way, I found myself more frantic, found myself not sleeping as much as I needed to. I found that it compromised my health, that my mind was going faster than my spirit, and that instead of finding energy through all of this activity that instead it was draining me and that perhaps really the best chance we can do is just sit there and wait for God's reasons and way to be come out and certainly that was what happened for me you know things that I was so anxious about and concerned about they all began to kind of dissolve other things began to kind of sustain me and really friends I think all of us if you right now are in that dark night, uh, there's no magic formula to offer. It's really just about clinging, holding on tight, and trusting that God's glory will be revealed to you in God's right timing. And so I want to conclude. We've been at this for the last six weeks on soul keeping. And I want to just kind of leave with kind of three practical observations that I hope can, you can kind of latch on to. And, and here's the first. That, you know, uh, that we have to always be willing to pray without ceasing. That's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 6. Pray without ceasing. And you know, uh, even when we're in that dark night, 
that even if their prayers as simple as saying, Lord, have mercy. That's all it's got to be. <laughs> Pray without ceasing, Lord, have mercy. Because, you know, for Peter, uh, when Jesus challenged him, it was constantly, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And all we can respond is, yes, Lord, have mercy. Keep the channel open. Pray without ceasing. I think the second thing that we have to realize in this journey is that uh, just as Peter learned, that it's also, there are things not to get so self-absorbed, that we've got to be willing to feed sheep, care for the flocks that God has provided for us, that if you're in that dark night and, and you just kind of think that you've got to be kind of taking care of yourself, that I would venture to say that if that is your primary focus of taking care of yourself, you will never ultimately get better. <laughs> Because I don't think it's all about us. I think it's about how we look out for one another. We were not intended by our creator to suck up oxygen and get as much comfort as we can. We were intended by our creator to be a blessing to others who are around us. And so that's what it's about. Not to get so inner self-absorbed that we neglect feeding sheep, caring for lambs, feeding the flock. We live in a hungry world. We don't have to have all the answers, but we can tell others where we found the food that sustains us. Finally, I think that what we can begin to discover is that when we're going through those challenges of our soul, that if those are times where we've just got to hold on tight to trust and to have faith that God's glory and God's hope will be revealed to us in our lives. You know, uh, we will find ourselves in times where we go in places we would rather not go. I mean, think of Jesus. I promise you, Jesus did not want to go to the cross. But ultimately, Jesus trusted that when he held on tight to God's way, that new life would come. And friends, in the same fashion, when we're going through those challenges, when it seems like the rug has been pulled out from underneath us, we want to abandon everything and just kind of curl up into a ball. Those are honestly opportunities. You don't have to do anything other than hold on tight. Trust that God's answer and God's hope will be revealed to you. And so the closing words really come to us from the book of Hebrews. <coughs> When the writer says this, be sure to seize the hope set before us, for we have this hope. It is a sure and steadfast anchor, anchor of your soul, the hope of Jesus Christ, the anchor of all of our souls. Let's pray. Almighty and Heavenly Father, in this journey, we come across times of deep and painful suffering. Times when it seems like uh, we just want to get swallowed up. And holy God, it is in those moments we just have to cling to you. Realize that uh, you have a plan for our lives and that your glory will be revealed in your right time. And so until then, gracious God, help us to um, feed one another, uh, help us care for each other, help us to have hope, and help us to pray without ceasing. And that in this formula, we will find the deepest care for our souls. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.